Hi everyone. I thought today I'd try something a bit different and have a bit of a discussion about how you use the Woodward Hoffman rules to justify whether a cycloaddition reaction, so a type of pericyclic reaction, is allowed or not under some given conditions. So I thought I'd just start by defining what a cycloaddition reaction is. The first one that people normally come across is a Diels Alder reaction, and that's a reaction that when you have a diene and you react it with a so called dienophile, so that's like an alkene with an electron withdrawing group on it. The electrons will whiz round in a ring. You specifically require to heat this reaction to progress onto the cyclohexene product like this. Now, these reactions are completely different to, to the more common ionic type reactions where you have a homo interacting with a lumo and you push the curly arrows from one to the other. To describe what's going on here, we have an awful lot of molecular orbitals all overlapping at once. And providing the molecular orbital symmetry is all OK, the reaction will proceed. If it's not, the reaction's forbidden. So in a general sense, a cycloaddition reaction can be identified by one where two pi systems, so this is just a sketch of two separate pi systems, they could be in the same molecule or they could be two separate molecules. They come near each other. We provide them with some conditions, which is either heat, photochemical set of conditions, just representing that by H nu. Now these pi systems come together to form two new sigma bonds between their ends. So I'm just putting these circles here. These are the carbons at the end of these systems and we form a ring. And at the same time as forming those two new sigma bonds, we've shortened the pi systems. So generally there's a driving force this way from left to right, as we gain two sigma bonds in one step at the expense of what would normally be weaker pi bonds. And we need to use the Woodward Hoffman rules to ask ourselves the question, is it allowed? Now I'm just going to show you how you can use these rules by example. And I think one that's quite good for doing this is to consider this reaction scheme. I'm going to react cyclopentadiene with this methalal iodide in the presence of a silver plus cation. And I'm also going to heat this reaction. Now the silver plus will become a Lewis acid for the halogen and encourage that to leave to precipitate out silver iodide into our reaction flask. So it's essentially a way of generating this allyl cation. The allyl cation We'll do a cycloaddition with the cyclopentadiene, which can be described like this to form a product that, well, I'll just try and draw it a little bit in 3D. And this carbocation that forms can then just lose a proton to form probably the more stable alkene. So to analyze this system, I need to focus on the cycloaddition step here and identify the pi systems involved. So I have one pi system on the bottom here and one pi system coming from the top. And I'll just give myself a 3D diagram in the bottom left-hand corner so that I can use the Woodward Hoffman rules. So there's my cyclopentadiene and I'm going to form some bonds with these dotted lines with the allyl cation at the top. And what I do is I draw in some p orbitals. So these are pi systems. That's a conjugated 3p orbital in the row system at the top and the conjugated 4p orbital in the row system on the bottom. We're trying to describe the reaction where we get overlap between this lobe here indicated in green and this other one on the right. And then we need to use the Woodward Hoffman notation. Now the allyl cation has two electrons in it and it's made up of a pi system. So what we normally do is just give it a qualifier like a subscript of a pi. The bottom system has four pi electrons in it, so we call it a pi four system. And if we look at the two systems, just highlighting that one in yellow and the other one in blue, we can see that we have a continuous ring. We've got two systems with two connecting loops. So we can define the top yellow system as suprafacial, and that's because we're coming out of the same side of that molecule on both ends of the pi system. And actually we can see that's happening again on the bottom system, so the pi four bit will be S as well. So the Woodward Hoffman rules tell us that we need to look for systems that can be represented by labels that fit the pattern of 4q plus 2s, where q is an integer. So this will be e.g. systems that have 2, 6, 10, 14 electrons that are suprafacial. And we also need to look for systems that follow this pattern where r is an integer that are antarafacial. So this will be numbers like 0, 4, 8, etc. What we have to do is count out the number of these systems that we have in our diagram and see what the total is. So here we have a pi 2s component with the star that contributes one to our count for the top bit. And the pi 4s system isn't one of the required labels, so we don't count this one. 
So overall, we've got two systems, one which is a 4Q plus 2S. We have no 4RA components. Therefore, the total of these is one. That is odd. And what we say is that this reaction is thermally allowed. Now, this is a very strict condition. This reaction will only work if we heat it up. And it's all to do with orbital symmetry behind the scenes, the details of which I could cover in another video. That, I think, is the easiest way to use the Woodward-Hoffman rules. But it's not the only way. Because these are strict mathematical rules, it does, actually doesn't matter how we break up our, our systems. It just gives us a little bit more work to do. So as an example, I'm just going to give myself the same diagram as before and consider the reaction with these dotted lines and put in my p orbitals. Now this time, I'm going to pretend that I've completely forgotten that conjugation exists and that these are just isolated systems. So I'm going to treat this one as an isolated pi 2 system, another isolated pi 2 system on the bottom. So each of these alkenes is just a pi 2 system and also just an empty p orbital there, so like a carbocation. So this is a pi 2, pi 2, pi 2. And this is a zero electron system. And who knows what the reason is, but non-bonding orbitals are often designated the qualifier omega. Now, to get the reaction that I actually want to occur, I definitely need to overlap these two bits that I've indicated in green. But we can see now that each of these four components has only got one connector each. We can't define the S or the A labels yet. We're going to have to make some arbitrary choices in here, and it doesn't really matter what our arbitrary choices are. I'm just going to make two different ones. All that's important is that we connect these things together in a geometrically sensible way for their orbitals to overlap. So for example, on the top, I could overlap these ones here in purple, or I could equally well in orange, connect them up on the bottom face. It really doesn't matter what we do, but the one thing we can't do is just teleport the electrons from one face of the molecule to the other. I'm just going to keep the purple one for now, and I'll do a different type of connection on the bottom molecule. So I'll just connect across there in purple. And now we have four components and four connectors. That means we can do our Woodward-Hoffman analysis. So I need to look for things that I can count towards these things. So for the top left component, I can see where my connectors are. They're here and here. There's one coming out of the top face and one coming out of the bottom face. Therefore, this component is designated an A for antarofacial. Looking at the top right, same deal. One's coming out of the top, one's coming out of the bottom of that empty p orbital. So the omega zero component is also an A on the bottom left component. Well, both the connectors are coming out of the top face. So that's an S component suprafacial. And on the bottom right component, they're also coming out of the top face, both of them. So that's an S component. So just counting, well, any of the two electron systems will go into this top one. And we've got two S type ones there. So we get number two. And looking at the four R type components, well, it's our omega zero that contributes to this one. And we've got one of those, which is an A. So we get the number one. Adding those together, we get three. And because that's an odd number, we know that this is firmly allowed. And that's reassuring that we get the same thing for both of these representations. Just using the same diagram, I just thought I'd show you that you can do this in a slightly different way and it's not wrong. I'm going to take out the purple component on the cyclopentadiene to take out one of the connectors at the bottom. So what I've done is just taking out the connector down here. I could have also geometrically joined it up perfectly sensibly across the bottom here. So I've put in another connector there in orange. Now that changes my labels. So the S's and the A's disappear. My calculation is going to have to go. And just to see what we've got, well, actually the top component is still an A for the pi 2 system and still an A for the omega 0 system. But on the bottom system, we've also got a pi 2a now on the left-hand side and a pi 2a on the right-hand side. Now, if we look at the pi 2 systems, the things that contribute to the 4q plus 2s bit, we don't actually have any superfacial ones of those. We've only got antarofacial, so we put a zero here. We still have our omega 0a, so that didn't change. Our total ends up being one. That is odd, and therefore it's firmly allowed. So the same conclusion happens regardless of what we do here. It's what happens when maths interacts with organic chemistry. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel. I've put a few other videos of mine up here now on different organic chemistry topics.